Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary here in New York City. Thank you for joining us in another of our series of Just Conversations where we engage issues of racialized and other inequities intrinsic to our nation and our collective responsibility to create a more just future. On this January 6th day, we bring you a special Just Conversation on this first year anniversary of the insurrection at the US Capitol. I am pleased to be in dialogue with my colleague and my friend, the Reverend Dr. Liz Steele Harris, minister, activist, and author, who is co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, and director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights, and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary, and author and most recent editor of We Cry Justice, Reading the Bible with the Poor People's Campaign. Thank you, Liz for joining me in this conversation today. Now, let's get right to it. Liz, I wanna begin by asking you, as we think about a year ago today, what were your first thoughts when you saw what was going on at the Capitol? I mean, so thanks so much for having this conversation and, and being in dialogue with me. Um, and thanks especially for your your leadership, Kelly. Um, but I, I feel the same kind of emotions that I felt a year ago, which is with just extreme fear, um, fear for our democracy, fear for especially poor and marginalized people, um, and and fear that we got to this point um, it didn't come out of nowhere. We we all are aware of that. But um, but to watch folks emboldened by people from the highest levels of office office be allowed, you know, with those police. I mean, I I've been arrested at the U.S. Capitol many times, and right. and and the treatment that folks received that day, um, and the really the kind of lack of consequences that have happened since. Um, are really different than when people are peacefully, nonviolently um, trying to to raise issues, um, and that's because, again, it was up to the highest levels of, of government. And so, uh, you know, it it makes me really see what kind of a moral crisis our our nation is going on in um, and and experiencing, and um, and also makes me then feel like you know we, we we have to keep on organizing and fighting and struggling and and challenging this but um I, i'm wondering how how you felt that day what some of your thoughts were um and 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 what it means you know in in our in our lives today as well yeah thanks liz uh, similar uh to yours, I, I, I remember that day uh, vividly, right? And, and, and some of those same sort of, not the intensity of feelings, but uh, those same, the intensity of thoughts are reemerging on today. And I remember I was working and, and continuing getting texts, you need to see what's going on. And so I went and first, my first thought was disbelief as I saw what looked like ninjas scaling uh, the uh, Capitol building. And, and then I, the, my second quick thought was, you know what? If these people were people of color, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have ever gotten that close mm -hmm. to, to the Capitol. And I remember, you know, I was down here in Maryland, Washington, DC area and went down to uh, the Black Lives Matter protests at one point in Black Lives Matter Plaza. And that place was ringed with National Guard. Uh, and so I couldn't imagine uh, how they could have ever gotten that close. And that created within me this deep sense of uh, an even deeper sense of understanding the reality of Black life and the life of people of color in this country and that, in fact, uh, because of the color of the skin of most of those people on that Capitol Hill, they could get away with that and they would, uh, it would have been a bloodbath. And I continue to get texts throughout the day from people, uh, you know what this would look like if there are Black people. The other thing I thought that is intensified and stuck with me, Liz, and I build upon what you say here, is that uh, 
that didn't begin on that day. And, and that that could uh, happen as quickly as it did and that our country could find itself in that particular acute crisis moment. It was a, a reflection of the realities of who this nation is that it is not dealt with. And so uh, before I say more about that, it, so the third thought that quickly came to my mind uh, after disbelief and oh my goodness, uh, good thing those aren't black people down there, but black people would never be down there doing that, uh, uh, was that this was our, and we are in a 21st century civil war moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and that this, this nation really needs to decide mm -hmm. what kind of nation that it wants to be, which leads me to ask you, Liz, because hearing you talk about the sort of moral fiber of our country, if you will, being at stake. A lot of people uh, we hear talk about the way the our democracy is at stake, and 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 and, and yes, but I think there's something much deeper uh, than that. That prior to that moment on Capitol Hill has put our democracy at risk. What what are your thoughts? What does it tell us about our nation? Yeah, I mean, thanks so much for, I mean, all of that, those thoughts, that analysis, because in, in, indeed, there, there's so much going on. I mean, I think when we, when we look at the world today, or, or we look at it, um, how it was January 4th, January 5th of, of last year, I mean, we are living in a, in a crisis, and it's an economic crisis, it's a public health crisis, it's a crisis of our democracy, and it's a kind of a and it's it's surely a, a, a deep moral crisis. I mean, we live in the richest nation in the world, and yet, you know, before the pandemic, which has only made things worse, um, there's 140 million people who are poor and, and and or one emergency, one storm, one healthcare crisis, one job loss, one couple hundred dollar expense away from economic ruin. Um, you know, we had just uh, gotten through. I mean, the the Georgia runoff was just the results were just coming in right and and we had seen um uh despite two presidential elections and and election cycles without the full protections of the voting rights act we had seen a multiracial uh coalition of especially poor and low income and other voters you know show up in record numbers um to to vote for candidates that were actually talking about issues like systemic racism and health care and and COVID relief and and living wages um and but but to live in a society that has that level of poverty that has you know uh so many um lives being killed i mean again pre-covid 250,000 people were dying a year from poverty um then you add police violence, you add mass incarceration, you add, you know, inequities, um, and then you add, you know, governmental inaction in the face of a public health crisis. Um, and, and we've gotten comfortable with death um, as a society, um, the death of our democracy, the death of, of, of human life, um, and then death of a kind of our, our deepest moral values that say that that lives matter, black lives matter. Um, and that 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 marginalized people's lives matter, that poor people's lives matter, but that life, you know, God's children um, have to have a have have good, uh, thriving lives. And so so to to live in this society right now, um, you know, and, and we had public health crisis, um, uh, public health officials, you know, talking to us. And and I know, Kelly, you and I have had this conversation before, too. I mean, again, before the pandemic had hit, we had pandemics of racism, pandemics of poverty, pandemics of of inequality and and violence and violence against women and LGBTQ folks, right? I mean, and again, our society has gotten used to to death and to violence and normalized those things, and 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 you have that all kind of uh, kind of covered with with religion, um, especially Christianity, um, and you know, I, I think you. You've done such important work on these, on on all of these issues, um, but you know it, it's we have to kind of put them out there. Yeah, no, Liz, thanks for that because I, I really do believe, right, <laughs> that a couple of things came together to uh, make uh, what happened a year ago 
possible. Mm -hmm. Things came together to make the MAGA vision and movement possible. Mm -hmm. And so that that sit at the seat of our so-called democracy, truly at the foundation of this country. One, that you talk about we've gotten used to violence. Well, you know what? That's right, because inequality and injustice, that's violent. Anything that doesn't respect the sacred humanity of another human being is violent. So we, the, you cannot have a stable or a fragile uh, or a, a stable democracy when you have such inequality and when there are people who feel disconnected from from uh, their very nation, from from the quote unquote uh, democracy, and so we have so many people who felt disconnected, so many people who felt themselves disenfranchised in one way or the other because of their poverty or whatever the case may be. They felt disconnected. And and then you can fill that vacuum with the kind of hate and fear and lies uh, that the uh, architect of the MAGA vision put forward. But then the other thing that came with that, so you had people who came there for various reasons, but certainly people got involved in various movements because they felt disconnected, if you will, from the quote unquote democratic dream of this country. And then on the other hand, at the foundation of this so-called democracy has been, as both of us have talked about before, and within the DNA, this notion, this Anglo-Saxon exceptionalist notion, the American exceptionalism, which has always been Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, which has always been about white supremacy. And we have never talked uh, and told the truth about that. And so it was easy. You know, if you don't take a weed up by the root, that weed keeps uh, coming back up. And when it comes back up, there's more weeds. And so it was easy for the MAGA vision and its architect to take hold with this sort of white supremacist, if you will, uh, ideology that was undergirding it. So all all of those things came together to, uh, and, and it ended up in this cri- quote unquote crisis moment on January 6th. What it should have done, and which is so distressing, I think to me, is that it should have called this nation to account, at least those people who claim not to support uh, what was going on up at the Hill, and caused us to say, you know what, it's not our democracy that's at stake because the fact that that could happen means that we never had a democracy really. What's at stake is the soul of this nation in determining who we want to be. To me, we are in this civil war kind of moment that we have to make a decision. But Liz, here's the thing, and you mentioned this. You know, we're both uh, 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 ministers, you know, and, and, and we are both driven in so many ways by our faith because we believe uh, at least the least thing that faith means is that we have to make the commitment to partner with God and bringing forth a more just future and all that that means. We know that there were plenty of Christians, quote unquote, up there on on Capitol Hill that are part of the quote unquote mega vision. Studies have told us that 30 percent of uh, uh, Christians sort of submit to white Christian nationalism. So now here's the thing. There are others (laughs) uh, which are, I would hope, the majority of uh, those of us who would call ourselves Christian. And then though there are other faith and religious leaders that are, 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 are not Christian, and uh, but religious leaders and presumably have a different sense of values. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What, Liz? <laughs> and it's always a head scratcher to me when people say, oh, look what they've done to Christianity. No, look what they're doing under the name of religion. It, and I always like to say, look what we aren't doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, what should be the role? Liz, of of faith and religious leaders. We see the nation's response to what happened last year, and some people are in deep denial. Uh, What should we be doing? So I I really appreciate, you know, this question. And if we think about the fact that that we really are in and approaching a kind of next civil war, right? what What we always see throughout this country and other countries' histories 
is that there's a kind of a battle of theology, a battle for the Bible and our deepest moral values and traditions that takes place and polarization when you when you get to a place where, you know, you have such um, such different, such polar opposite visions of what uh, what needs to happen um, and and what what can happen. And and so again, if, if we, we go back uh, to the Civil War, I mean, you had you had Christians battling that right. battle of theology right out, right? I mean, so you had the slave Bible that had, you know, the Exodus, the prophets, you know, Jesus' inaugural sermon all cut out of it. Um, and that, that emphasized, you know, slaves obey your masters and, and um, uh, you know, told stories of Christians sending people back into slavery. I mean, and, and, and this whole apparatus, you know, from not just biblical interpretation, but but the structure of of religious living and 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 religious life, um, you know, was all to prop up the system of U.S. chattel slavery, right? Um, so, uh, but but it it wasn't it didn't have the last word, um, and and it couldn't have the last word, and so you know you have Harriet Moses Tubman. Um, and and that is an acute nickname that that's how how she was thought about and and how she thought of herself um in terms of playing a role of of leading hundreds of the enslaved out of of slavery risking people's lives to show how immoral and wrong this system was you you have frederick Douglass who you know has this this kind of uh, quarrel, quarrel him, his own self with Christianity, but but is preaching all the time and putting out, you know, not seeding theology, not seeding where God is very clear, might be mad that that this is is how things are, are, are playing out and, and definitely upset about this kind of heretical Christianity that is upholding, you know, U.S. chattel slavery, but but is then talking about, you know, how he he kept on praying and praying and praying and and his his uh, prayers weren't answered until he started to take action together and 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 this god of justice you know supporting um the abolitionist movement and 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 i i just think it, it if then we kind of bring ourselves to today right we as a people especially as christians who who do not uh uh agree with the tenets of of Christian nationalism, um, and who find, you know, heresy and anathema there. Um, uh, we still have to point that out, and we have to put out uh, for for our people um, and for ourselves a, a different vision, a different interpretation, and and one that is rooted again in in tradition. I mean, uh, yes, empire always takes uh, religion, always makes it. Um, you know, hold, uphold the status quo, but also throughout history, there are always moral movements that have to rise and have to kind of battle these these battles out and say, no, we are uh, followers, you know, in the case of, of myself as a Christian, of a God who defines God's self as I am the one who led you out of Egypt, right? And, and whose first inaugural sermon is, uh, uh, you know, the spirit of, of the Lord is upon me. Uh, God has anointed me to preach good news, evangelism to the Patokos, those who have been made poor by policy violence, right? Um, and so so to, to what it says, so what we need to be doing, because again, uh, there's a lot of, of what we need to be doing in this moment. We, we have to not allow for for folks to kind of warp and and contort and interpret and theologize um, and to make it that that poor people and black people and immigrants and queer people are sinners and instead instead say injustice and poverty and racism is structural sin that that God requires us commands us to do something about and then we have to organize 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 in our communities in our faith communities in our you know community organizations and in, in all aspects of life um to show that that a, a moral movement is possible and and that everybody needs to join and 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 not allow uh for for others to to kind of pervert the the message of 
justice and liberation and freedom. Because again, if you cut that out of the Bible, cut that out of our traditions, then there is nothing left. Yeah, you know, one, I agree. Uh, a couple of things is we bring it to the close. And even for those who may not be religious, you're human. And to live into the best of our humanity, right? And, and, and that begins, I always say, with never withholding from another with that which you would not want withheld from yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and let's just talk about the sort of the basics of what it means to, to be human and to thrive and to live and to fulfill whatever your vision is. And Liz, I also think of the fact that at the root, really, at the foundation of our country is this theology of, of white Christian nationalism because this country was founded on the notion that we were going to be this city on the hill that sh uh, shined forth what it meant to be a city of God. And that what was always connected to this notion of Anglo-Saxon uh, exceptionalism. We got to tell truth about that. Mm -hmm. And what you also say reminds me that uh, as a theologian and people say, oh, theology is academics of the theology matters. And, 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 you know, that's why someone like Rhino Niebuhr has come back to the forefront of public discourse because love him or hate him and he did good things. He was a public theologian and he always spoke to these matters uh, as well as persons like Cornel West and others who do it today. Theology matters in this regard. The other thing you said, and probably we'll begin to get out on this, was being engaged in movements. And, you know, I know for me that uh, it became a very despairing time when after seeing what happened on January 6th and, and even seeing the aftermath that, you know, they're really, people aren't really getting uh, the, uh, justice that they deserve for what happened uh, on January 6th. And again, I can only say if those people were not, if they were people of color, uh, if they were still living, they would be under the jail, uh, not getting these little sentences uh, that they are getting. But it, so it was a moment of despair, but what led me out of that despair was really going down to Black Lives Matter Plaza. And it was there that I was really able to witness that, you know what, there is a movement. There's a, for me, there's a God that is acting against these things. So I think of ways in which, you know, we can respond to what happened last year by trying to, to resist and create a, a, a different narrative and a different future, which leads me to this as a long prologue to this. They call what happened down there uh, last year rally to uh, a quote unquote rally. That's what uh, the narrative has been, but to stop the steal, meaning the steal of the election. So it seems to me that one of our first priorities is to indeed stop the steal and to stop the daggone steal of people's vote. And further disenfranchising those that have already been deemed in this country, perhaps essential laborers, but not essential human beings and not essential citizens. So that it seems to me that one of the most perfect responses to what happened down there on uh, that capital, uh, if we really do think our democracy is at risk, then stop allowing them to continue to steal our democracy. And that, uh, that we must be engaged, we must put pressure upon Congress, we must be engaged as uh, religious and faith leaders in this movement to stop the steal of people's right to vote. I have John Lewis's picture in back of me to, to continue the work that he gave his life for. Uh, and that that is one of the, that's when we, the movement toward justice. And that's one of the first things that we can at least call people uh, to account to do in our faith leaders. That's absolutely right. And, and I would just, you know, in, in conclusion, kind of add that, that what we have seen since January 6th is they weren't able to accomplish a coup um, uh, there. But we have seen in 49 state legislators, I mean, 19 that have passed it so far, a rolling coup, 
um, where it's the largest attack on our voting rights since That's the Reconstruction, right. right after that civil war, right? Um, and it's and and it will it'll take a generation to kind of come back, even just from what already has been ratified in in 19 states 33 different laws and so it, so indeed we we have to keep on coming forward and saying let's defend this democracy let's protect voting rights um, let's uh, expand them um, and let's connect those to other forms of injustice including economic and um, racial inequality um, because again there are solutions out there that are at hand um, that that the people that have been elected have the power um, right now. The Senate and Congress can expand and protect our voting rights, and can raise wages, and can you know invest in the people, um, and we need them to. Um, and and as people of faith, we 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 also have to keep on on making that prophetic critique until they they do right. So last question, quick question, get out of here. A year later, we're one year later. Where do you see us as a nation? And what's the hope for our future? So today is, is Epiphany. Um, right. It's Three Kings Day in my neighborhood. Um, I'm Armenian, and so it's Armenian Easter, I mean, it's Armenian Christmas. Um, and it's a day where, you know, these economists and scientists um, find hope in a poor, Palestinian Jewish refugee who was born homeless. Um, and, and, and from those that are rejected, a moral movement um, is growing. And so I, I see a lot of problems, a lot of despair, a lot of fear, a lot of violence, um, a lot of attacks on, on people's lives, especially impacting poor people and people of color. But I, I see where the hope lies is in is in those very, you know, kind of those who have been rejected, um, the cornerstone that was rejected will, will, will lead, you know, um, will become the cornerstone or, or the, the, sorry, the stones that the builders rejected will become the cornerstone. And I, I think I see that um, happening in our world today in, in the low wage worker protests and the Black Lives Matter protests and in the work that the Poor People's Campaign is doing and the work that so many different environmental movements and others are, are coming forward with and, 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 and it needs everybody. No, and thank, thank you for that. And thank you for reminding us all that today is Epiphany. And uh, I'm a, an Episcopal priest. And of course, Epiphany is at the center of our uh, calendar as well. And for me, it's a day of revealing, mm. right? And so as I think of a year later, and on this day that was Epiphany last year, it revealed to us who we are as a nation and who we are as a people. Let one year later reveal to us who we want to become as a nation and who we want to become as a people. And let that reflect what it means to be in this Epiphany moment when indeed for those of us who celebrate this day of epiphany, God revealed to us who we can be and ought to be as sacred children of God's. Liz, a lot of work to do, indeed. a lot of lessons to learn, a lot of truth to tell. I am glad that I am in this struggle with you to become a better nation, a better people, and to just stay on the arc that bends toward justice. Thank you all for joining us in this conversation. And I hope that each of you make this day that is the first year anniversary of the insurrection on Capitol Hill, a day where you indeed reflect upon this moment and ask yourself, who do I want to be? How do I want to participate in the struggle to become a better nation, a better people, indeed a better world. Thank you for joining us. Okay, those are